Welcome to the Rusted Garden Homestead. Today I'm going to answer 10, 15, maybe 20 questions on starting seeds indoors. These are the questions I get asked regularly and rather than you having to go to 10, 15 different videos, I'm going to put them all into one place. First question I get asked often is, how high should I set my grow lights above my seed starts? And the general answer is anywhere from two to four inches. I have mine at about two and a half. It is most important that your lights are really close to your germinating seeds. You can see the lettuce right down there. If you take these lights up too high, the power of the lumens, the power of the intensity of the light decreases greatly and your plants are going to be leggy. So at germination, or when you're waiting for germination, when you're starting your seeds, you want your lights to sit two to four inches above your seed starts. Now, I always recommend, and you can check out my other videos, I'll put a link in there, you want at least 2100 lumens or higher, and you want 5000 Kelvin all the way to 6500 Kelvin. And that's for uh, the color of the light, and that mimics daylight. Now, with the f new LEDs, sometimes you'll get lumen value that's 5000 lumens or higher. Those lights can probably go higher. The lights that you see right here are about 2700 lumens so I keep them about two inches to four inches above the seed starts. The next question I get is how long do you keep the lights on? So when you're starting germination before the seeds come through the surface that is the most important time for the intense light to get to your seed starts. So I leave my lights on 16 hours why they're, while I'm waiting for them to germinate and break the surface. You want that 16 hours of light to hit the plants when they break the surface. This way they don't get tall and leggy. They'll hit the light, they'll stop growing. The reason they get leggy is because they don't have enough light so they still think they're in the dirt. So they're stretching for the sun. So germination, I leave the lights on 16 hours. Once they break the surface, I leave them on 16 hours, five to seven days and then I start cutting back to 14 hours to 12 hours and you can really do that as you wish. As your plants grow, raise the lights. You can be two to four inches above you know the leaves that are growing upward. The light intensity becomes less important once the plants have been growing for about two weeks. You just really want to make sure you got the intense light when your seeds germinate. The other question I get asked is do I need to leave the lights on while I'm waiting for germination? And the answer is no. I mean, if you can go in and check, and as soon as you see it break the surface, turn your lights on, that's great. But if you even miss this for a 24 hour period, once they break, they're racing to get to the top. So if you miss germination by a 24 hour period, 48 hour period, if you're busy, your plants are gonna get leggy. So I'd like to turn these on about three days after I've had the seeds in the starting mix because they're just not really going to germinate within three days. So they'll start germinating between five and 14 days. That's up to you. All right, I get asked a lot of questions about the south facing window and do I need to use grow lights? Let me go over to that window. So here's my south facing window and a lot of times people say, do I need grow lights or can I just put the seedlings in a window? 99 times out of 100, you need to use grow lights and this is why. You have to have direct sun hitting your seed starts for a good six hours, you know, maybe eight hours, but a good six hours. And very few windows do that. I happen to have sun that starts over here and tracks all the way across. This is a pretty good south facing window, but I don't even think this is intense enough. Now, could you do it? Yeah, your plants are going to be a little bit leggy because it's not enough sun, so they're going to get taller. What I recommend is using grow lights at least for seed starting. Let them get 5, 10, 14 days of intense light while they sprout up. Once they're established and been growing a little bit, you can move them over to a window like this. But it must be direct sun. It can't be in indirect sunlight. If I go up, you'll be able to maybe see the sun right up there. That big blur right there is the sun. That's the direct light coming in. If you don't have the direct sun in a window, you can't use a window. All right, let's go to the seed starting trays.
The next question I get often is, well, what's a seed flat and what are seed cells? This is a standard flat. This is how I recommend you water. We'll get to that question in a second. You can see right in there that my flat is filled with, what is that, 6, 12, 18, 24, 30, 36, 72 cells. Those are the standard starting cells. You get 72. You can start 72 plants at once in that small space. And people ask me, do I need to start it that way or could I use bigger cups? And the answer is yes, you could use bigger cups. Now the reason I do it this way is I get all my plants started into 72 cells in a single flat. And as they get larger, I plant them up into larger containers, but I time it so they go outside. And the basic question you have to ask yourself is how many plants do I want to start? If you want to start you know, 500 plants, you're going to have to use the six cells. And you can see all the plants that I have growing there. In fact, that one right there is a four cell. I'll talk about that in a second. If you're not going to grow that many plants, you could go to the four cells. And when you put in bigger cells, you end up with less plants. But there's more dirt held in here, so your transplants can stay in there longer. And you can go even to a bigger one. And your tomato and pepper transplants, because of the depth, could stay in there the entire time. You don't have to pot up. And you would have 6, 12, 18, 36 plants. And that's plenty for most people. And that's what they look like. You can find most of these supplies on my seed shop if you want to check it out. So it's really up to you. You start with more cells if you're growing a lot of plants and you don't have enough space. Obviously, if I put this in there, it's not going to be as many seed starts right there. Now, if you're even doing fewer, you don't need to use the cells. You could just put recycled um, nursery containers in there. You could use styrofoam cups. You could use whatever you want. Just make sure you put holes in the bottom and you could just set them in this tray. I always recommend getting a flat like this, I do sell these at the seed shop, so that you can bottom water. It makes life so much easier when you're starting things indoors. If you're looking for a place to buy seeds, I have a seed shop that's kind of small. If you can't find what you want there, I recommend Everwild Farms. Beautiful foil packaging. They can reseal. Each seed package will reseal. You can keep the seeds easily for three years, if not longer. And they're beautifully decorated. Information on the back. And you can find them at everwild.com. All right, let's get to watering. All right, before I get to watering, let me talk a little bit about seed starting mix. One question I get asked a lot is, well, why do I need to use a seed starting mix? Seed starting mix is essentially sterile, except it can have fungus gnat eggs in there. In the previous video in the series, I show you how to sterilize it with boiling water. I highly recommend you do that. Use boiling water, uh, use a microwave, bake it, whatever you want to do you really want to make sure you don't have any fungus gnat eggs. Now, this is made up of peat moss, vermiculite, sometimes a little perlite's thrown in there, but any peat-based product probably has fungus gnat eggs. Putting in the boiling water will kill them. It's good to do. Next question I get asked, well, aren't you killing all the uh, microbiology, all the soil life in your starting mix? And the answer is no. There is nothing of value in seed starting mix that's going to aid your plants. So by putting in boiling water or microwaving this or baking it, you're not damaging anything. You're just making sure the soil is sterile from the fungus gnat eggs, insect eggs, molds, that kind of stuff, fungus, whatever. Sterilize it. It will save you a great headache. Next question I get asked is, can I use earth soil from outdoors? You can, but you are going to definitely be bringing in Insects, molds, diseases, all kinds of things that may not be a problem out in nature because they have their enemies and, you know, sunlight and other insects and organisms take care of it. But once you bring stuff from the outside indoors, the bad stuff seems to go wild. So, yes, I do recommend using a seed starting mix. You can get cocoa core, which is shredded uh, coconut husk. That probably doesn't have peat moss, but you still want to sterilize that. Now, when you get your seed starting mixes, if it's cocoa core, if it's um, a peat, peat moss based, it's going to be dry. Never 
pack your seed cells with dry starting mix. If you do that, you're going to have dry mix on there. When you try and bottom water or you water from the top, it's going to float and splash everywhere. You have to pre-moisten it. And you pre-moisten it to the point that there's enough water in there that when you squeeze it, maybe a couple of drops come out. And that's how you get started for um, planting your seeds and getting your transplants going. To set up the cells, throw it in there. People ask me a lot, well, how do I set them up? Don't just throw it in once and leave it in there. It's too loose. You want a nice, solid planting base. Push the starting mix down. I call that thumb packing. And then you have a nice, solid planting base for your seeds to develop really nice root systems. All right, so once you have this set up, you've planted your seeds, people say, well, how often do I water? And the answer to that is it's going to vary. It's going to vary on how warm your house is, how warm the lights are, the size of the cells. These are going to hold more water than the smaller cells. And the answer is, let's see if we can move this out of the way. You can see the cells over here are a lighter brown. That's what it looks like when it's dry. Over here, they're darker. There's moisture on the top. Your seed starts, the cells will always dry from the top down. When they look like this, they're dark brown, little flakes of brown they are starting to dry. They don't need to be watered. When it looks like this, watering is going to need to happen within a day or two. It is a good idea to let the tops of your seed starting mix dry because that helps combat possible fungus gnats. It also combats fungus and diseases that may be growing on there because when it dries out, um, they don't like that. So let them dry. Let's see. You can take a look. I know the light sometimes plays tricks. Let me turn this. So it'll be hard to see, but these first six are starting to dry. The ones back there are still dark brown. So your cells are going to dry at different speeds. Now, they always dry from the top down. That means this part's dry. The water will start drying down here, but there'll be plenty of moisture down here for the root systems of your plants to get to. So let the tops dry. So when it looks like this, maybe a day, two, three days, you're going to water, water from the bottom. Now. A lot of people say, well, you know, the reason you got fungus gnats is because you didn't let the top of your soil dry. Well, I have news for you. Fungus gnats don't just lay eggs up here. So letting it dry, sure, that does help. But they also climb right down into the bottom of your tray. And where there's moisture in the bottom holes, they'll lay eggs down there too. So don't listen to people that tell you that you've done something terribly wrong. That's why you have a sick garden. Every garden has its own set of insects, diseases, Fungus, yes, you can make mistakes, but usually those things are present and you just have to learn how to take care of them. You don't get an infestation of fungus gnats because you're watering too much. All right, how do I water these in the most efficient way? Again, watering is going to vary depending on the size of your cells. Those are the smallest ones, 72 in there. Actually, they come smaller, but I use those. If you're using the bigger cells, they're going to hold more moisture, but you're going to look for the top of the starting mix to dry, and then you're going to wait a day, two, three days to let, make sure everything is dry up there, and then you're going to bottom water. Why do you bottom water? Well, if you had your uh, 36 plants in here, and I get a cup, and I'm pouring water on every one, that's going to take a lot of time. It's going to splash soil out. It's going to mix possible fungus and diseases around if you have it. And if you're just starting and you got seeds sitting right there and you pour water on, it's going to splash the seed around. Bottom water, which means you just fill up this flat. And again, I sell these at my seed shop. And you fill them up maybe a third of the way, a quarter of the way. It's going to vary on your setup. With time, I've learned um, to really put in the right amount so that it gets absorbed. And I don't have to dump this out. But you put the water in, set these trays in wait 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you'll see the light brown soil that's like right up here will absorb the water and it'll become a nice 
dark brown like right in there. Hopefully you can see that. That takes about 20 or 30 minutes. After that, you know, you can let it sit even 30 minutes, an hour, two hours. But you don't want the excess water sitting in here because too much water down there takes oxygen away from the root systems in the starting mix and you can get root rot and it causes a problem. So you will have to dump this out after about 30 minutes or 60 minutes, any of the excess water. But with practice you get really good at it and you'll know how much water to put in there and it won't really be a problem. And it's so much easier just to go through all these trays, fill them up with water, let them absorb and you're done. Rather than having to pull this out and like water each one of these, that would just be crazy. You also want to make sure that your shelving unit is level. You may have to put shims or something cardboard under the bottom corners because if it's not level, the water's all going to rush to one side and it's not going to get all of the cells. All right, let's see what else we can talk about. A couple of questions on lighting. How many lights do I need? These are two tubes. And again, these are 2,750 lumens and 6,500 Kelvin. And you can find videos on my channel that explains all of that. So with the flat, you're really going to want two lights on this side, two lights on that side. So that's four. So if you're going out and buying a system, you could buy a four bulb system. You could buy these two bulb systems. But you want to make sure that your light is covering a span like that. Um, you can put foil across the top, put the reflective side down. I'll be doing that when they're a little bit bigger. Foil coming down here, that will reflect some of the light in. If you didn't want to use two of these, and you can see I've got my flats turned this way, I'm really getting three flats. You can just use one, two bulbs, and it would sit across a flat that's going in that direction, and that would be plenty of light. But because I'm starting so many, you want four bulbs. The other question I get is, you know, should I use a timer? For sure, 100% use a timer. That's my extension cord with a built-in timer. It's set for 16 hours on. You can get any kind of timer that you want, but it really is a plant saver and a time saver. And then I would turn that down to 14 hours, you know, after a week or two's, two, yeah, a week or two's worth of growth and then back down to uh, 12 hours after they've been growing longer. Next question I get is feeding my plants. Do I need to put fertilizer in the seed starting mix? The answer is actually no. I've talked about it in the past. I've put in organic fertilizers that are insoluble. That means soil life has to break it down. And remember what I said before, there's no soil life in there. So your insoluble organic fertilizers aren't going to do much except allow fungus to grow on there. And it usually doesn't hurt the plant, but it's really unsightly. So you don't want to be putting in blood meal, bone meal, or any kind of organic fertilizer that has to be broken down by soil life. You want to use soluble fertilizers. That's fertilizers that when they're mixed with water or moisture, your plant can use them right away. But at planting, you don't technically need to put anything into your seed starting mix because the actual seed coat, and you can see some of the seed coats on that lettuce that's coming up, have nutrients that will supply the plant with what it needs for at least a good week. All right. Now I'll be doing videos on using worm castings. I use worm castings. Uh, sometimes to set up my seed starts. It really does make a difference and I'll just talk about it in another video because it's a long video. All right, when do you feed your plants? After they've been germinated for about a week, they'll look pretty good. You could put in a very diluted water-soluble fertilizer down to like a quarter of strength, even less, in just one watering just to give them some nutrients. But you're really not going to start feeding these until they've been growing a good two weeks, have their true sets of leaves. I'll talk about that in other videos. But you don't have to rush to fertilize your seed starts. In fact, you can do a lot of damage by putting in too much fertilizer. Always use quarter strength of the water soluble or less. It doesn't matter what water soluble fertilizer you use. You can pick whatever you want because it's going to build up in there. There's no uh, rain. There's nothing 
coming down on the soil, washing fertilizer away, your plants aren't using it that fast, we tend to overlove these plants way too much. You just need a water soluble N, P, and K at quarter strength or less occasionally for your seed starts. And I'll talk more about that if you want to sub subscribe to my channel in depth as these plants start to grow. At what temperature should my seed starts be at for the best germination? And the answer depends on the plant. Your cold weather crops, lettuces, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, all those types of plants actually will get kind of leggy even with the lights two inches from there when it's like 70 degrees and warmer. Because of the warmth, they grow really fast and because of the light, they're growing quickly and they'll get a little bit leggy. Those cool weather crops actually would do better at like 60 degrees. But most of our homes are at about 70 degrees. Tomatoes, your warm weather crops, peppers, eggplant, like 70 plus degrees. Um, if you get up into the 80s, they germinate even more quickly, so it depends on what you're growing. But generally speaking, 70 degrees works for just about every seed out there. If you're doing cool weather crops, just be aware that if you're growing them in a warm area, they might get a little bit leggy. So you could even give them some time outside, actually. If it's, you know, 40 degrees outside, um, you could put the flat out there, let them get sun, let them get some cold, and just move them in and out. Move them in here at nighttime. Do you need a heat mat? Maybe. If you're growing super hot peppers, they tend to germinate slowly. Um, you would just put the thin heating mat right under there. Um, it keeps them at about 80 degrees. And then the next question I get is, how long do I keep that heat mat on? Well, the heat mat should stay on if you're using it until your seeds germinate. Give them a couple of days to get established. And if your temperatures are staying in your house or wherever you're at, 65, 70 degrees, 75, you don't need the heat mat anymore. If they would drop down below that, yes, you're going to need it. But use the heat mat. Just get them germinated more quickly. Get them growing. After a couple of days, you could take the heat mat away. Should I label my seed starts? And the answer is absolutely, because you'll remember everything when you're doing it, but you're going to forget. And there's a couple of ways to do it. I use popsicle sticks here if you want something that's biodegradable. I just break them in half right on there, what I'm growing. Always put the start date on there somewhere. So these were started actually uh, yesterday on 2-2. If you don't have anything that you want to put in here, and the reason being is sometimes you could use the white plastic, but they because your lights are low, sometimes these get in the way. So you can also do this. You can just break this up to represent the cells in your flats and then write what's in there. And the way that I do it is I know that I'm starting right here, left corner, and I put a piece of tape on this corner. Now don't take these out and shuffle them around or you're in trouble. And I also put a marker here saying when I started, these are peppers, I started on 128. So I start here, work my way that way along this list and it tells me what I'm growing. All right, I think I'll finish up with just talking about what the inside is like for a plant to the outside. Outside, they're getting hit with cold, with wind, with sun, UV rays. Your plants that are growing indoors under grow lights aren't getting any UV rays. So they're gonna get nice and lush and healthy and you're gonna be really proud if you move them outside and they sit out there just for one day with full sun, the sun is gonna burn and damage them. All your plants that you're growing indoors have to slowly be acclimated over at least a week's time to the sun. That means giving them like 30 minutes of sun, bringing them back inside, or putting them out on a cloudy day and letting them get more sun. You have to make sure you transition them to the outdoor weather. Even these plants that are gonna be growing in the south facing window, they'll be a little bit tougher because they're getting some of the sun coming in, but the windows block some of the UV rays. So just make sure after you spend all this time really taking care and growing wonderful transplants that you don't put them outside and shock them. All right, and maybe actually one more tip. Because the days are often 40, 50, 60 degrees, if these just break the surface now, let's say, and today it's actually, even though there's snow on the ground, it's gonna be 40 degrees out there. When these break the surface, I can put them outside in the cold at the 40, 50 degrees. Um, let the sun hit the germinating seed because when they break the surface, they're all ready for the sun. It's after they're growing for a while that they lose that um, 
resistance to the UV rays. So if they just break the surface, it's a nice sunny day, put them out there. They're going to love that real sun hitting them. Just bring them in before the evening or before it starts getting really cold and you'll toughen your plants up while they're growing. So you could like, you know, take these out for a little bit. Now the only kicker is that if you take them outside, there's a chance there's going to be insects that come in. So that's really up to you. Um, if you get a mold problem or a fungus problem, sunlight is your best agent for sterilizing that. So if you put them outside, the sun is going to take care of molds and fungus too. All right. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hope I answered a lot of questions about seed starting that um, all of you have asked and hopefully it'll be very um, valuable to you in the sense that you don't have to go and track this down through all kinds of different videos. Um, the Seed Starting Basics is going to be a series. Please subscribe to my channel. I'm going to be talking about hydrogen peroxide for sterilizing your soil and taking care of problems in my next video. Thanks for watching.